Hi, so I've been asked to talk about this a lot, actually, and I thought, well, it's time to talk about it a bit. Now, that's probably because we've done lots on different kinds of generation, and we've done lots on different kinds of storage, but nothing at all on how to link the two together, or how to actually use them when it comes to installing in your house. So I thought, yeah, that's a really good idea, actually. I, sh I should spend some time on that. And so I'm going to do that. Now, it is not a complicated subject, but there is a lot of information, and that can be um, quite daunting at times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up. We're going to talk about different kinds of generation and how we go about storing that, and then how we go about connecting it and using it. So there's going to be a few videos, and they're going to be a bit random, because obviously we're kind of in, in the middle of doing an exploration, so I'll do them every now and then. And what I thought I'd deal with first is wind generation, because wind generation is something that we're uh, engaged in at the moment, and, and obviously it's of great interest. So I thought I'd have a look at wind generation first and talk a bit about that. Now the problem with wind generation is you can't actually just tie your wind generator up to your battery. Because if you think about it, a wind generator and a motor are in fact exactly the same thing. If you feed electricity in, it'll act like a motor. If you spin it, it'll act like a generator. I mean, they're built slightly differently so that you get better performance from one or the other, but in their essence, they're identical. So if you don't have any wind and you have a fully charged battery and you connect those two up, all that's going to happen is your wind <laughs> generator is going to turn because it becomes a motor. So you can't just connect the two together. You have to have something else in between. Now, with a wind generator, there are only three states it can be in. It can be not turning, in which case it's generating zip. It can be turning in the range in which it was designed to generate, from a certain wind speed minimum to a certain wind speed maximum. And then it will generate quite happily at the rated output. And then the third condition is where it's spinning just too quickly and it's generating far too much. Now, that's possible, obviously. I mean, we've seen it. We did a conversion of a stepper motor, and even with the lightest of turns, we got 50 volts out of it. So it's quite possible to generate far too much if your wind is too heavy. And you need to take account of that, and you need to control that. Now, equally, on the other side of things, you need to take care of your batteries, because they'll be in one of three states. Discharged, half-charged, or fully charged. And if your battery is fully charged, you don't really want to be putting any more in there or you'll blow your batteries up. You need also to charge batteries in a certain way, depending on the battery type that they are. If you put too much voltage onto a battery, lead acid is a good example, what you'll basically do is boil the contents and give off lots of hydrogen and sulfuric acid gas. Not brilliant in a garage. If you do that with lithium, then you stand a chance of thermal runaway and the whole thing going up in flames. So it's not only that the battery can be in one of three states, you also have to charge them at certain ways in order to make sure that you don't destroy the battery. So considering those two sides of things, you have to put something in the middle there that will take care of that. Now, obviously, we also need to add something on so that we can use it. So a very basic wind system would look something like this. Now the first component we have is obviously the wind generator. Now the wind generator we can think of as essentially three coils. It's a three phase generator. And we can think of it that way because mostly that's what they are. If you're thinking about using something like uh, an Amatec DC motor or a treadmill motor, which is pretty much what lots of people use when they build their home wind generators, then it's going to be three coils that are in a magnetic field and it's going to give out a three phase output. Most of the um, standard micro and mini wind generators are also going to be three phase coils. So you tend to have three phases come out. If you have one phase come out, which would be really unusual, but if you do, then the first step that you would do is rectification and you just use a single rectifier. For a three phase, you need a three phase rectifier and a three phase rectifier actually looks a bit, uh, looks a bit like this. is just diodes. It's quite common to use low voltage drop diodes like Schottky diodes, but you can also buy these in a single package. And you have diodes like that. 
This side is your positive, this side is your negative, and what you do is you link each one of those coils to one of those lines. And that is your three-phase rectifier. So the first step is rectification. Then what you need to do is pop it into a charge controller. Now a charge controller is a really interesting piece of electronics that you can build yourself. All it really is, is a switch and a sensor. It mostly sensors the voltage at the battery terminals. You can do other things, they can get very fancy, but mostly that's actually all it does. Now this feeds into the switch, then back out of the switch into your battery bank. That switch can switch between a couple of things. If it switches here, then you're just going to be charging your battery. Remember the charge controller pays attention to the state of the battery, so it'll take care of that for you. If it switches to this one here, what it actually goes to is something called a dummy load or a dump load. It's a load that can burn off the excess energy. So if this thing, your generator, is turning too fast and you're producing a huge amount of energy, you don't want to be trying to feed it in your batteries. You want it to go somewhere else. And there's lots of places you can put it. One thing is to just use a resistor. And you'll see them, they're just great big resistors and they're meant to burn off energy. They're power resistors and they get hot. It's a bit of a waste to do that, so what you quite often see is that they go into an immersion heater. And you put that in a tank of cold water and it'll, it'll heat your water up for you. Another thing that you actually see is a bunch of lights. Anything that has a resistive load that can be dumped into, hence it's called the dump load, if this is turning too quickly. Now whenever you connect a generator up to a load, and it's a very high load, it will effectively break the generator. So it acts like a brake on the generator and prevents it running far too quickly. Now that can actually be a switch, it can be a relay. I quite like relays, but it doesn't have to be. If you want something that's a bit more robust and reliable, then what you're going to do is use MOSFETs. They give a great deal of reliability to that. Now after the charge controller, obviously, what you actually want to do is feed it into your house. And to feed it into your house, you use an inverter. So that is, in essence, all the system required for taking and connecting your generator up to your house supply or your battery bank. And it isn't that many components, you're only talking about four extra components. You have a rectifier, you have a charge controller, you have your inverter, and you have your dump load. Like I said, these can be made, and there is quite a lot of instructions on how to make those, but to be honest, a reasonable one is going to cost you about $30 or so, so you have to ask yourself the question, to what extent do you want to make one of those when you're concerned with a setting a system up? Like I say, it really is that simple. Now, I'm frequently asked to make a recommendation about uh, pieces of equipment. I can't really recommend anything particularly, to be honest, because when you enter into a marketplace, you're always going to have the same three choices. You're going to have something that's dirt cheap. You're going to have something that's really, really expensive. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of things right in the middle of the price range, and it's up to you what you want. If you want a charge controller that's going to have a full colour display, link with your phone, now leave messages to it and put sugar in your coffee when you want to drink, you're going to be paying a lot of money for such a thing, and, and rightly so, I suppose. But you have to ask yourself, do you need any of that stuff? If you have a basic charge controller that gives you absolutely no information and works on a relay, then it's going to be really, really cheap. But how robust and reliable it's going to be, well that's going to be questionable and you're probably going to be repairing the thing or replacing the thing quite often. So what you're really looking for are those mid-range price charge controllers, one that can cope with the output from your particular generator and gives you the functionality that you want. 
Equally, there's going to be a range in that mid-range where you're going to have things like very nice displays, you're going to be able to set different settings on it. I mean, at a minimum, you need to be able to set the voltage that you're using on your battery bank, and it's very often 12 or 24 volts, something like that. And there's usually just a link switch or a flip switch to switch between the two on more of the mid-range ones. They tend to have line displays giving you basic information like the number of volts on your batteries, amps used, that sort of stuff. It's not tremendous in the amount of information, but then equally you have to ask yourself what it is that you actually want, because that's going to dictate an awful lot about what that controller is going to look like and what that controller is going to cost you. Now in themselves, they're tremendously simple things. As you can see, there's only really two wires that you connect in and two wires that you connect out. And you'll see on the controller what those wires actually are. Very often rectification is contained within the charge controller itself as well, so you often don't need the rectifying circuit, they're just uh, part and parcel of what you can get. Now, there are lots of other things to talk about, and like I say, we will be going on to those other things, including how to connect that inverter up. But I thought I'd start with wind because it really is a simple circuit, there isn't that much to it. I hope you enjoyed the video, watch out for other updates on this, and thank you very much for watching.